He's going bye-bye. Verse 10. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, I'm not picking on the guys for looking up at all. Because I tell you what, if anybody in this room levitated and just kind of like went through the ceiling and just kept going and going, I'd be looking up too. <laughs> I mean, I'd be, I'd be pretty impressed. Jesus is being carried, or something, being taken up into a cloud. They've got to be seriously amazed. But I don't know if you ever thought of it this way. Jesus called them and they walked with them every day for three, three and a half years. Every day they walk with him, he's right there. Then he's crucified, he's gone. <coughs> three days later, he's back for 40 days. Every day they're talking about the kingdom and all kinds of stuff. He's gone, he's here, he's gone. Now this is not just, you know, waiting for next seasons of a television program to start. They are like so seriously assembled together with Jesus. When he's leaving them again, think of the emotional upheaval. You see, as they're gazing up, I'm sure that their jaws are on the floor and they're amazed. <coughs> but I'm sure they're also thinking about it. He's leaving again, and we're not going. He told us to stay here. Don't leave. Wait. What I'm trying to say is that this was a very, Luke doesn't record all the emotions and everything involved, but these are real guys really going through this situation. And as Jesus is ascending and they're looking up, yes, I'm sure Matthew could remind them you know, he did say where two or three are gathered in his name, so, I, so there am I in the midst of them. Well, that really complicates it now. Because Jesus is taken off. He's ascending out of their sight. That's far, if you look up into the sky during the day. That's very, very far. And yet, he said to them, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am there. It's starting to feel a, bit, a little bit eerie or weird because he's there, he's here, but he's certainly not here the way he's always been here, the Jesus that we've known. We just adjusted to the fact that he's a kind of a shapeshifter almost. You know, we don't recognize him in the garden. We don't recognize him at the Sea of Galilee. We don't recognize him in the upper room. We don't recognize him on the road to Emmaus. We've just kind of gotten a hold of that. Now he's not even in that form, but yet, he says he's here, and he breathed into them the Spirit, and he told them, and the Spirit is coming. Now, if all this language doesn't send us into a bit of a, I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, we can theologically deduce everything and talk about it. And the point is that all of this just is kind of like, what? So they're gazing up. Verse 11. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So while they're gazing up, two angels are right next to him. I, I wonder, to be honest with you, if the angels don't ask them why they're gazing up, do they ever even see the angels? You see, they're gazing up and the angels have to ask, actually ask them, what are you doing? Now, like we said, they could have said easily, are you serious? I am well impressed. I just watched somebody ascend past my eyesight, past the clouds, taken up in a cloud. And someone else might say, actually, I'm gazing up because the one that's loved me more than I've ever even loved myself is gone again. And I don't care what you say, if anybody, if the angels or anybody would have said, yes, but he said where two or three are gathered. So you know what that makes for good preaching? I don't see him. I just saw him leave. I don't even necessarily feel him. I feel you. I hear you, I don't hear him. I don't think anybody in this room has ever seen Jesus ascend the way these guys did. But if you haven't, you will feel some point like God has totally lost your email address. That you and he are separated and that he is gone. So what do mature disciples do when God is gone, where he's nowhere to be found? When you feel like you've got it all, hey, I've got the Word, I've got a Bible, I've got the Spirit, I know He lives in us, the whole thing, I've got it all except Him. It's a bit like where we started in the very beginning in Lessons 1 and 2, but it's much more profound. We can say things like, you know, to be looking for Him, using our imagination, looking for Him when something's happened that shouldn't have happened, and, you know, not leaving Him when He's hard to understand, and 
could say a lot of different things. But this situation, this particular teaching, lesson, whatever tonight, really is like, what happens? What do we do when we feel totally separated from God? Actually, it's even worse than that. When we are teetering on the edge of if there's a God at all. On the cross, Jesus said seven different things, and one of them was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you have not been around in any of the times that I've talked about that, we'll revisit it sometime, because it's really worth getting into. The point is this, when you read about the cross, you read that there was darkness from 12 to 3 o'clock. That's called unexpected. If I asked you guys tomorrow between 12, 12 noon and 3 o'clock, you think it's going to get real dark like it is right now? Unless you had a word from God that said it was, I seriously doubt that you would expect it at noon tomorrow to be dark like this. So from out of nowhere, you're thrown into unexpected darkness. Actually, it's beyond unexpected. That just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. It doesn't get dark at 12 noon. 12 to 3 is when the sun is the highest. That's when it's the brightest, not the darkest. It's not supposed to get dark at 12 noon. Excuse me. It's beyond unexpected. It's beyond normal and natural. These things don't happen. Besides that, looking at the cross, Jesus is being crucified and nobody gets it. Nobody understands. When you read through it, go back and read the accounts and read what's going on all around him. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands. I've been thrown into supernatural, unexpected darkness. There's people all around me and nobody's having a problem with anything. And Jesus, after he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says that he cries out. It's not a little whimper on the cross. Father, into your hands. I can... He's screaming it at the top of his lungs. Something is going on between the Son and the Father on the cross. Totally for our benefit. There is something going on at that moment that Jesus is demonstrating to us that he might as well get off the cross and say, Mark, let's talk about this. I'm telling you, there's going to be times where you feel like you're thrown into a tailspin and nothing is making sense. It's freaky, it's weird, and he could go on and on about it. I know. Because I felt the same way on the cross. We know that in Psalm 22, the psalm that he quoted, and I don't think it was just a quotation, I think he's screaming it out, but... David does tell us in that psalm, yet he did not forsake me. He was there. But this is the tension. This is the problem. If you've ever been in a place where you know he's there and he's not there. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know he's there, but he's not there. And I'm telling you, that darkness right there is a supernatural, it's an awful, awful darkness that it's not even talking about but the light is in the darkness, as we're going to see tonight. That's not even the point. The mystics would refer to, they got it from St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul. Yeah. A time when there's no sense of God at all. And I don't know exactly what the spiritual condition is, but in our soul, it is awful. Like I said, each week we've taken a little thing. This one is not waiting for him, because if it's, it's, it says to wait on him, not for him. And the reason why I put it that way, when they were looking up and he was getting further and further away, he had left them a word. Wait, it's a hard word to hold on to during the dark night of the soul. But you know what? It's the only word you got. Wait on him, not for him. During the dark night of the soul, the stiff neck, whatever, it's not waiting for him to do something. The only thing you can do is wait on him. There's different kinds of waiting that involve attitude and action. It's interesting that we won't go back and read it right now, but Noah, when the 40 days are up, you know, and he sends the raven out and the raven doesn't come back, he sends a dove out, the dove does come back. And it says that he waited seven days before he sends the dove out again. Sends the dove out again, the dove comes back with the olive branch, and it says he waited seven more days before he sends the dove out and the dove doesn't come back. Now in our English Bibles, it just says he waited seven days and then he waited seven more days. But they're two entirely different words. The first waiting has to do with like uh, being twisted 
writhing in pain or in fear. So, for seven days, Noah is beside himself, writhing in pain and fear. But the second seven days, it says when he waited, the context is patiently in hope. So we get the same words, waited and waited, but two entirely different things. We give us two demonstrations. The first time when the dove comes back and there's nothing in his mouth, that means there's no dry land. And it sends Noah into a tailspin. For seven days, he knows he's got to send that dove out again. But for seven days, the kind of waiting he's doing is not, is not nice. He's being twisted up. He's in pain. He's in fear. He's in anxiety. All these things. For seven days, he sends the dove out. The dove comes back with an olive branch. He waits seven more days, but now he has a hope for the future.